This is the final word, the Australia-India Daily, the test series. Between those two countries, uh, Jeff Lemon and Adam Collins with you. The show brought to you by Morris Blackburn, Australia's number one plaintiff law firm. Well, there'll be a few plaintiffs perhaps <laughs> after today, Adam. A day of test cricket, day three of the test. Please tell me all about it in the space of 30 seconds. Uh, we'll try as if it were foretold. Jaiswal advanced to another test done in the most audacious fashion with a ramp over leg slip. He moved on to 161 by the time he was done. Some of that was batting with Rat Coley. What a joy to see those two together. A passing of the torch of sorts. Coley went into rapid fire mode after T along with Reddy to make sure they had the declaration set up. And in the process, recorded his 30th test ton to pass Don Bradman. What a joyous moment it was. Then the real action at the end. Three wickets in Four and a half overs, including Marnus Labuschagne shouldering arms at the end. The ball's variable bouncing. The ball is hooping around. Boomer is untouchable. India have got 522 runs to play with and seven wickets in hand for Australia. They are gone. Now, Jeff, 30-second summary gone. 30-second summary gone. Wow. I've been to quite a bit of test cricket where Australia have yep. had these moments where it's like, this is crisis mm-hmm. time. Like we've experienced it in Trent Bridge. We're at Nottingham in 2015. Uh, Hobart in 2016, the All Out 85 day with South Africa. Of course, what happened in, in Cape Town, which is slightly different, but equally um, equally brutal in terms of the way this all played out. Mm-hmm. I think this will be there right with them. I think conceding 315 runs in the way in which it all played out and then losing three wickets before the close, such a hotly anticipated series, being so yes. far ahead of the game, having dismissed India, it seems scarcely believable now. They bowled out India inside two sessions mm-hmm. for 150 only a couple yep. of days ago. And at that point, it was like India's screwed. And now, they're, st- now yeah. they're staring down the barrel of one of their biggest test defeats ever, all in the space of a couple of days. It has been remarkable. Remarkable to witness, and it's going to be most interesting recapping it with you. It's, it's. I mean, obviously, I think a lot of people watching this will be saying, talk about Virat Kohli. He oh, we will. 100. Oh, we, we will. will. I we'll promise you. That. We'll get to that in a moment. Just but, stick but, with us. Don't, don't leave like, the podcast because we're not talking about Kohli yet. It feels like the most important part of the day was was that ending bit. And yeah. look, Australia getting mm. sent back in with, you know, two and a bit days to go. They're, they're never going to bat out two and a bit days to save a test match. That doesn't happen. They weren't going to score 500 to win a test match. That doesn't happen either, right? At the point that India declare, Australia are losing this test match unless, like, somebody digs up the pitch or something yeah. like that. It, it is, that is what's going to happen. But there are ways to lose a test match that are less chastening than this sort of thing. This feels like the kind of thing that Australia have done to visiting teams so many times. Just pulverise them. Just make them field out in the sun for a couple of days and then pop them in at the end and then they're three down at stumps. It it felt so easy in a way because Boomer is just a genius. And that spell, the, the fineness of the margins where he's bowling quite wide on the crease, he's like got that wrist behind the ball sort of flicking it down there. He's having it angle into right-handers. And it's he's having it hit them just like millimetres inside the line of off stump. But the angle isn't so much that it's going to take it down the leg side. Like it, it's extraordinary precision to be able to do that. McSweeney immediately. Siraj nicks off Cummins, who comes out as a night watch, which is interesting in itself. Uh, and then Boomer to Labuschagne, who, who leaves the ball. It, you know, three in quick time. Yes, one of them's a night watch, so it's not quite as bad as it sounds. But still... The, the momentum, uh, that sort of late in the day bit, feeling like it did on the first day when Boomer had the ball, where you've got the shadows coming over the ground, where you've got that tired team, it was just a, a brutal taking apart of a side that didn't have anything left. It's, it's right what you say about some losses are, are kind of worse than others, even when the margins might be different. Like The biggest compliment I can play, pay India, I think, is that it actually felt like I was watching India pulverise Australia in India. Like We've seen versions of this mm. over the years, right, where India are able to just destroy in Australian attacks when they're so far ahead in the game and, and then when they get the ball in the fourth innings, it's it, the game's on fast-forward mode, yep. right? Now, Boomer, the game always feels like it's in fast-forward mode. I mentioned the variable bounce in the 30-second summary. That wasn't to diminish what's going on. It's to highlight the degree of difficulty for Australia now mm-hmm. with Boomer. So, as you say, yep. so able to make the most of his unbelievable accuracy that he will locate those cracks tomorrow and he will take more mm-hmm. wickets because of them. And the McSweeney downfall is obviously part of that because it did keep low. That's fine. That happens. But, boy, I felt for McSweeney having to face the first ball. I'm sure the line out of the Australian camp will be that he insisted upon it. But I don't know about that. I reckon that there's probably a role to... There's, there's probably, probably a role for Kawaja who can insist more. Yeah, there's probably a role there for Kawaja, and I don't, I don't want to get stuck into Usman Kawaja on this basis too much because I'm sure he'll say that McSweeney said it's me, mate. But yeah, anyway, that's just a passing he, comment he, on the way is through. It, is that McSweeney's choice? 
does he get to make that call? Does the guy on his test debut get to say it's me? I don't think he does. It's a, it's an odd it's an odd part of what happened at the very end. Um, Cummins, if, if you're the senior player in that position, you make the decision. You don't let the other player make the decision. And Cummins did make the decision to walk out as night watchman and was nicked off to Siraj in what became Siraj's final over because playing it early. Again, does he do that if Labuschagne's not willing to have him do that? I don't think he does. Like I, I think to, using a night watchman's quite... I don't have any problem with a night watchman being used to protect the number three. That's 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 very conventional. I mean, this team's used night watchman's as far back as, gosh, I don't know. When was the yeah. last time we had a captain not using him? Steve Waugh, possibly? Feels like a long time since we've had an Australian no, team okay, not use them. Not to say that there's a blanket rule that you never do it, but I think what stood out to me is... The amount of time, it was more than 20 minutes before stumps when Cummins comes out. That feels early to me. Like oh. you see, I think you'd send in a night watch if there's an over or two to go, not if there's five overs. I reckon go. if we did the maths on how, how often Lions come out, night, not, Lions the night watchman a million mm. times. And my instinct is that Lions come out any time from around that market. But it doesn't really matter. The point is, is that what we're trying to say, what I'm, what I'm, the point I'm trying to make it, is different to that. It's that Cummins as a senior player said, no, no, I'll walk out, I'll do this unbelievably shit job which I'm almost certain to fail in. Yeah. Um, and that's okay. But anyway, we're moving off from the main game here, which really is Labuschagne's dismissal at the end. And yeah, the mitigation, if you want to go there, would be that how difficult is it with the booming ball and so on, but it's the mindset problem that yep. has been remarked upon by almost every single pundit. And we're not talking about people like you and I, we're talking about people that did this for Australia in the top six as well. And to a person, they're saying the same thing. The positive intent that Labuschagne built his game on has all but gone. Mm. And... He talks pre-series about being the Pajara. I suppose I would say there are ways to do that. Being in such an excessively negative mindset before the first ball is even bowled, that doesn't marry up or tally with the guy who was number one in the world until yeah. 18 or 24 months ago. It felt like today he was on the proverbial hiding to nothing and reinforces the point I made two nights ago. I don't think they sack Labuschagne never to be seen again, but I do think it's time to take him out of the firing line. I don't think he should play at Adelaide. Yep. I think it'd be better to pull him out one test too early than do so if Australia are struggling after Adelaide and do it one test too late. Yeah, that, that was the feeling that I got from those two things. I thought a, a player who wants a night watch that far ahead of stumps and a player who leaves the ball in the last over before stumps, that's not someone who's got the clarity of mind that they should be playing in the next test match, I think. And, and you know... Like you say, it might only need to be a short break. It might, maybe it's the rest of the summer, whatever it is. It doesn't mean yeah. he won't be able to come back into that side not. once he demonstrates that he's got things back on track. But he doesn't have things on track at the moment. No. And then you get into that whole discussion about the, the paucity of replacements and there aren't any super obvious replacements, all of that. None of that's really that important. That's all throwing forward. What's important is, is today. I mean, it was brutal today in a in a way where they didn't put the foot down for such a long time. No. So Kale Rahul goes through the first six overs of the day before edging Mitchell Stark. He made 76, you're going 77. to tell me. 77. They put on 201, yeah. which is the second biggest partnership in Australia mm. by an opening pair right. against Australia. I mean, remarkable. We've got to go back to 1902 with Hobbs and, yeah. Hobbs, Hobbs and Rhodes. I mean, okay. it, it's like... How, how, I, I was taken by that. Mm. There's never been another 200. That shows how rare the achievement was by that pair yeah. to bat through those two sessions yesterday and well, well, not well into, but a decent slab of this morning as well. Yeah, So they and then they have Patakal come out at that point. I mean, it almost felt like it was an accident when the wicket fell, the Australians were, sort of went to each other. Oh, oh, that's good. You know, there wasn't a celebration. It was like, why is Kale Rahul leaving the field? Yeah. That's weird. It was like there was just this little schism after Jaiswal got to 100 where there was yeah. two or three moments where they didn't quite have their heads screwed on. Yeah. Like, it was like nearly a run out. There was a couple of um, mm -hmm. couple of language shots where there's no footwork. It's like they just needed to reboot yep. to go again. But the truth is the job was overwhelmingly done. If anything, oh, I felt much. for Kale Rahul because I felt like he absolutely deserved 100. And, you know, he had a bit of a conversion problem with Australia back in 2017 where he made half a dozen 50s without 100. I was hoping today would be one of those where he'd get to get the full... Because he's always the scapegoat, isn't he, Kale mm. Rahul? A lot of Indian fans beat the shit out of this guy. There'll be people in the comments now saying he's fucking useless. That's always the way it goes with him, despite having put on 200 today, because I know mm. the way the stand stuff works. But, well, at least I think I do. But um, he was so good, and I've, I have such sympathy towards someone who's been shunted around the way he has been over the last few right. years. And then Patakal comes in at number three, and, you know, he's an IPL monster <laughs> when he wants to be. Yeah. So he could have come out and, and slayed them. He didn't. He just played sensibly, got them through to lunch. Look good. Um, and, and, which means that Jaiswal can basically do the same. Jaiswal's not super attacking. He hits that one six off Lyon. He hits the six to bring up the hundred. Mm. But he's not out there bombing it like he was against England at times during that test series where he was just taking them down. Yep. At, at certain times in the game, you know, smaller boundaries potentially and all of that. He played so sensibly. First ball after lunch, Patakal goes, edges Hazelwood to slip. Another catch for Smith, who 
must be climbing up the record catch his chart again, but I don't think that'll be making him feel very good today. And then it's Coley coming to the middle, and it was like, if ever there was a setup for Coley to get a handball for a, for a nice, easy start, there were 321 ahead, I think, at that point, and he's got as much time as he wants, he's got the opportunity, he's, he's got a, a broken bowling attack, That they're in the 85th over, yes, they've got a new ball, so he's got a little bit of work to do just to get through that, which he did sensibly. Um, with Jaiswell, and then and, and Jaiswell eventually gets out for 161, just cuts Mitchell Marsh to point, and is very surprised to have done so. It's like, how do I get out? I just that's weird. How do I get out to the most innocuous kind of medium pace going around as well, which I'll come to in the Hall of Fame. But yeah, you know, that that has set Coley up, and and a couple of wickets fall after that, and so on. They're five down, but he's got he's got a partnership with Washington Sundar. He's got a partnership with Nitish Reddy, and it's fine. He's able to just tick up to 100 that they really didn't need, but. It's more like it sets him up for the series ahead. That was the importance of the hundred wasn't that they needed it today, but that they might need it in two or three test matches yeah, time. Yeah, agreed. It was laying a foundation for the six weeks ahead. Uh, and look, he, he did. It wasn't like he. I don't know how long it took him to make the last twenty runs at Ahmedabad back in twenty twenty three, but it was done so longer than it was today, yeah. um, because this wasn't getting the monkey off the back hundred in quite the same way. No. But there was there was a lot riding on it, having missed out in the first innings, and again, like we anyone absorbs how much pressure that he gets online and all the rest of it whenever he misses out um he had double failure here even though they're way ahead in the game mm. and that'll continue to be a talking point now totally. that's not going to be a talking point right. for the rest of the series it means he can play with that degree of liberation and we're, we're talking marginal marginal gains because Coley's such a professional that he prepares the same way regardless of the, the circumstances but just trusting his game is good enough still to make big runs against this Australian attack, albeit, yes, a very tired Australian attack, but an Australian attack yeah. with 1,200 runs, 1,200 wickets, sorry, to their name, maybe more now, sure. probably far more than that, actually, nevertheless. So I thought that was very significant. You've still and got to take the opportunity to do you've it. got to like, do it. Like got to people, make the runs. People, hundreds of hundreds. You know, I've, the conversations I was having this afternoon, a lot of people were saying, oh, it's going to be ugly when Richard Punk comes out and they're, you know, 350 ahead and he's got licence. And I was saying, well, I don't think he'll make any because he likes it when they're in trouble. Like, Richard plays really well and aggressively when, when India are behind. And if he's got, you know, if they're 300 ahead, it doesn't really matter and he, he'll probably slog a couple and get out. So, and he did. He came out and had a charge and got stumped. Uh, and, you know, Nathan Lyon picked up a, a consolation wicket and he, what, he gets another one. It's Washington, isn't it? Who plays the big yep. swing across the line and gets bowled. Good bit of bowling, that. I um, mean, I don't think Lyon ever gave up. I think that Lyon continued to bowl consistently, didn't drop his head. There was that line last night about head dropping. Lyon spoke to press this morning and interviews this morning and was quite adamant that there'd be no head dropping from them and from him specifically. And like, I think he um, walked his words there. Mm. Just quickly, Jeff, there's a lovely thing going out behind us here in the car park where there are about 10 Indian fans holding up a massive Indian flag and they've got a, they're taking photo after photo in front of the stadium. I mean, why wouldn't you? It's a, a truly great day for Indian cricket. To think yeah. where they were a couple of days ago. I just want to back over one more thing. You know, I guess the bigger picture Australia stuff before getting more in the nitty gritty of Coley and then moving on. Like, I do think that where Australia are positioned right now means that it might necessitate wholesale changes. And this sounds wild, right? But I wouldn't doubt it. I wouldn't doubt that this could be the catalyst. You know, things happen quicker than you think they will in life mm. all the time. Um, and the idea Bueller of, had a line about that. <laughs> quite. And the idea of having um, farewells on your terms, occasionally that happens. Occasionally you get the, you know, the, the farewell 100, the Greg Chapel for one of a better yep. example occasionally nine David Warner lap whatever it is yep. or you know Dennis Lilly to use the same test match getting a wicket with his final ball those things do happen yep. occasionally yep. most of the time they don't mm. most of the time as it is in politics careers end in tears so and again I'm, I'm not saying that people are going to be machine gunned after this match necessarily but it wouldn't stun me if the outcry is so substantial that they do think fuck we've got another test match to play in a week and a half we need to think mm. this through very very clearly now um, they, they've made a decision not to over-prepare using the Cummins term before this test match. I think we saw today over 50 extras. To me, that shows a team that might have under-prepared in a pejorative sense. I know yep. that Cummins was trying to say, I under-prepared a hit peak form when playing, but no multi-day cricket or a scarcity of multi-day cricket. Um, having one-day internationals immediately in the lead-up to a test series, 
it all forms the bigger picture. Yeah. And the same applies to the batting group who some of them had, we talked about it last night on the pod, paternity leave. That's, that's one thing. I don't want to really count Head and Marsh in that conversation. But you know, was there an argument for using the Australia A, India A games to get more time under the belt of Marnus Labuschagne? There, there probably was instead of playing one-day cricket and resting and doing all the other things they tried to do in the lead-up to that series. Yeah. They're the kind of decisions that will be scrutinised now. And look, Cummins and McDonald have run a pretty bloody tight ship since they've come in. They've won. They've enjoyed a lot of success together. George Bailey is the chief selector as well. But that doesn't preclude them from, A, criticism, and B, introspection. And that's the next job for the, the powers that be within this Australian team. Because if they're 1-0 down, and they will be, by the time we have our conversation tomorrow, um, that is very difficult to come back from um, unless you get your shit together right away. 1-0, as we know in this country, usually becomes 3-0 before you work out what's going on. And maybe you win a test at the end of the series. Right. I think the one wildcard factor there is that the next test is a pink ball test. And Australia have played more of them than anybody True. else. And the four most prolific wicket takers in day night test cricket are all are in, in the team. Australian team <laughs> right now. So they know how to bowl with that ball and they know how to play those games in a way that other sides don't. They've got a natural advantage there. You know, maybe it's an unfair advantage that they have teams come and, and play day night tests when most, most other teams haven't bothered continuing with that idea. You know, a few of them had to go yep. back in the day, but that's probably a conversation for, for another time. That is the one thing that might make them say, well, we stick with what we've got because we know how to play this format, uh, this, this variation of the format in a way that other sides don't. So there's that possibility, um, but, you know, they'll, they'll be up against a, a hugely confident team there's there's basically no way India can fail to win this test match from here you know I mean it would be one of the most extraordinary no. miracles in the history of the sport it, it couldn't happen and, and the pitch yeah. is already staying low you know no. the, the bounce is erratic it'll be over the by middle of tomorrow at, at best right. unless unless some oh well, Kawaj is the kind of guy who can play that long fourth innings and he's done it at Perth in a long time ago in 2016 when he batted on a, a pitch that was completely destroyed against South Africa and made 97 you know he's the kind of guy that might achieve that and of course Smith's got plenty to prove when he walks in tomorrow but you know um, balance of probability this game's over yeah. by like the middle of tomorrow just pivoting back to Coley for a second sure. the buoyant um, the buoyant nature of the Indian team out of that. Nitish Kumar it was ready. fun. The end was fun. It's remarkable to think that like he may may not have played this test. He looks ready-made for test cricket. He, in, the, in much the same way that Harshit Rana on night one mm-hmm. looked perfectly ready to make the transition from 20-over cricket to um, test cricket at the highest level. So it is with Reddy. The, the, the shots he plays are straight from the T20 playbook. The strike rate that he goes at reflects that too and that's fine mm. not every day will he get the chance to, to punch the bruise the yep. way that he did today but he did do it in a counter-attacking way on day one as well which got India up up to 150 top scoring in that effort so he's had a fantastic start to his test career some of those shots were just wild mm-hmm. and beautiful in their own way in the same way that Jaiswell's shot to move to 100 I don't think we've ever seen 100 um, raised in quite that manner with a scoop that goes over leg slip. I mentioned it off the top. <laughs> That's ridiculous. He played a couple of shots like that yesterday. It didn't define the inning shots like that. It, it was probably the way he played with soft hands behind point that really mm. defined the innings in the way you need to against this Australian attack. Yeah. But when he made his mind up to go, especially against short bowling, mm-hmm. it was a total joy. And speaking of joy, the way that in one Pat Cummins over, Coley plays the most glorious checked on drive and two balls later, Jaiswal plays an equally perfect cover drive. Mm-hmm. You know, these are moments in time, right? Those two being out there together. There's a poetry. Yep. There's a symmetry. There's a, there's something about the way in which Test cricket provides you with these moments. Mm-hmm. I loved every fucking second of it. And, and Coley, it was the build with Coley for me, where he comes out and and he's just so precise <laughs> and professional. He you know nudges the ball into covers for his first run. He's like using the wrist to knock it to mid wicket. He's being circumspect. Yep. He's collecting. And then he gradually expands as he goes on. He, he does rifle a few of those straight drives and cover drives yep. here and there. Um, he, he brings out the little reverse to, to sort of get it past Steve Smith. To get to, like, to get to 95, I think that yeah. was as well. It 80, was a really, was really deep 80. into his innings when Reddy and he are both going for it with yep. six out and Labuschagne bowling leg breaks from round the wicket, getting wider for defensive bowling, bowling front foot, no balls in doing so. Yep. Um, you know, minus Trying the bowler everything. is probably a whole podcast that maybe we won't indulge in too much of that today. Maybe, I don't know. Maybe it'll never know. get made. Um, yeah, the step hit of Lyon, the six uh, that he hits down the ground, and, yep. uh, and then the, the very clever little dinking sweep to bring up the 100, yeah. you know, down, down to deep back with square leg. Uh, it, it was it was fun to watch him, you know, being at his best and, and feeling confident and playing the shots that we know he can play. How about the delayed response for both puns today? I thought that was quite neat. Hall, that we Hall had. of Fame. Oh, Hall, Hall of, Hall of Fame. Fame, that, okay. Yeah. But yeah, that, that was certainly part of the joy, I think, of the, the delayed gratification for both yes. of them. But yeah, we'll get to the, the celebrations. Let's get there now. Bit. Let's go Are to... We re- have we really done the whole day's play? Yeah, let's, I think so. Okay, can I just note, you know what? 
nah, I'm not going to do it. Okay. We'll push on. We'll, we'll, we'll have more time the day after the test match is over to do more introspective stuff. Okay. The okay. final word, Hall of Fame, after this break. Final it, word. It is. It's the daily. It's the Hall of Fame. It's brought to you by... Morris Blackburn Lawyers. It's brought to you by Visit Victoria. More to say about them when we get to Adelaide. Good. Brought to you by Seabus Super, celebrating their 40th birthday. All of our partners this year, specifically in relation to Morris Blackburn, Jeff. Number one plaintiff law firm in Australia. Yeah, right, On behalf of working people, they've been involved in all sorts of interesting and creative legal work over the journey, including some massive class actions. But fundamentally, they are there for you to make sure that your financial status doesn't preclude you from getting the legal representation you require. They've been doing this for 105 years, since 1919. Mm -hmm. When my country didn't say, son, no, it's time to start. No time for roving. There's work, to, there's work be done. to be done. That was in 1915. That was in 1915. It was when a different year. It was a tin good, hat, gun, good away four to years war. to miss. Good four years to miss. Good four years were, to not be your age. Unavailable. You but know. after that, after World War One, they were there Get front involved. and centre. Uh, Thirty places around Australia. Um, if you need legal support, um, please consider using Morris Blackburn Lawyers. We're very proud to be associated with them because they've been working on behalf of working people, which is something that you and I both feel very aligned to, given our upbringing and all the rest of it. Um, so, yes, please consider them. And as for Visit Victoria, they do great work. We spoke about them before. More next week. And we'll talk about CBUS at the end. Our home state. Go and visit it. Why not do it? <laughs> All right. Hall of Fame. Yeah, there was, there, there's the Coley moment where he's not sure. There's a diving attempt for a save on, a, on at the boundary line. And he hasn't seen the umpire signal. And he sort of waits. And he waits. And the crowd's already up and going. And then he's, he kind of cranes his head around one of the other players so he can see the umpire. He's like, are you going to signal that? Yeah, four. Yeah, you got it. Okay. Uh, and then he then he finally sort of is able to open his arms to the audience and pop the helmet off and do the thing. Well, there was he, he did some of the Jaiswal celebration, the identical arms thrown back, head to the sky after dropping the blade. I think he had the bat, bat occasional at the start then dropped it. As you know, Jeff, when on radio that kind of thing happens when you're not quite sure about whether it's four or not, yeah. you've got to buy time. And I was on air at the time. It's a privilege to call the Coley 100, I, I hasten to add. But, you know, you, you know vaguely what you want to say. Then you've got to kind of be in like, limbo land for 20 or 30 seconds but eventually Coley got confirmation from Chris Gaffney and I suppose from Travis Head down at fine leg and he could mm -hmm. go into the full flourish and as it was at Umdaba blowing kisses to his wife Winishka which was lovely yep. um, you know having had a chance to spend a bit of time talking with Coley recently when doing the Maxwell parts of the Maxwell book together I mean you know I now sort of feel as though at this part of his career I, my, 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 I just want him to enjoy this last part mm -hmm. he's been an absolute legend of the game and I think that there's that sense that no matter whether he's been someone who's been the pantomime villain or whether he's got stuck into your players or stuck into your team or whether he's misbehaved from time to time, we've reached the part of the Coley story, I think, where everybody is like on board Team Verat. Everybody wants to see him, um, I, I reckon, or the vast majority of mm -hmm. people. You have to be very uncharitable not to want to see Verat Coley really enjoy the autumn of his career. Right, and, and, and exit in a, in a happy and yeah. completed sort of way. Uh, the Nathan Lyon delivery to Coley that almost... Bold in yeah. my word, what an <laughs> off break. Drift, beautiful, drifts outside the off stump, pitches, turns, shreds through the gate and somehow goes over the leg bail by like it's it's yep. it's like the closest non dismissal I think I've ever seen in cricket. It was it, it must have been like brushing the bail somehow mm. without knocking it off. Um, it was extraordinary, lovely piece of bowling and uh, and Lyon got nothing for it. Bit of Jaiswal, love, back to that again. He's the second batter in Test history to turn all of his first 400s into 150s. Pop quiz, who was the other? You'll get there quickly. Opener, you'll get there quickly. 150 um, plus an opener who went nuts at the start of his career. Had a massive tour of England. You probably watched every single ball on Foxtel in the middle of the night. Oh, um, Graham Smith? Bang. Here you get there. Only two clues. Only two clues. I knew we'd get there. It was fine. Um, Graham Smith now... Um, now you said like, who, Jai as well. Who, yeah. I, I, um, like, I know there'll be people out there at the moment saying Lyon should be dropped because he took none for in the first and you know two in the second. And I, that's why, why I wanted to mention well, that delivery. I'm like, he bowled very, very nice. Nathan Lyon bowled beautifully yeah. today. Like, like, you know, there, there is no... Yeah. I'm not, not to Nathan, by the way, just not related to the match. Um, this morning, I saw him out in the middle and he's like, he was immediately all over the details of the Blind Ashes test uh, match that's taking place overnight. Like, right. um, he's an ambassador for disability cricket in Australia. Again, 
uh, lives his words. Right. He was all over it um, because uh, he's a good human being. So yeah. it would have been a tough day for Nathan. He'd be feeling every bit of this. But um, yes, it, just because they've had an absolute shocker mm -hmm. doesn't mean the 11 cricketers who play for Australia are fucking useless, which is obviously how it's going to be reported in sure. some quarters. That's what happens in Australia. But that does not marry up with reality. That's mm -hmm. just the way these things work. When they lost to Bangladesh in Dhaka in 2017, a terrific test match, duked out across five days. It was written up as the most embarrassing moment in Australian cricket history. That's the way these things work. You can ignore most of that bullshit, I reckon, and at the same time provide an honest critique of where they're at right now. Those two things aren't mutually exclusive. Well, they are, sorry. Um, oh, uh, do, 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 do. one more here, one more here. Where is it? Oh, how about um, Marnus Labuschagne's uh, average speed by being quicker than Josh Hazelwood's in this test match? <laughs> Presented without comment. Presented without comment. I'll also throw in a lovely stat. Mitchell Marsh today bowled the slowest over of his career. <laughs> On the averages. Um, he was knackered. Mm, he was knackered. Good plan to get um, Jaiswal, by the way, in the end. Yeah. Throwing Smith the um, backward point in a catching spot out of slip. Only took about five balls for him to get the wicket. So, you know, sometimes, belatedly, sometimes. a plan comes to pass. Oh, last thing. Not related to the Test match. Very Hall of Fame, very us. Tomorrow is Peter Siddle's 40th birthday. On his birthday. And guess what he's doing on his birthday? What? He's playing at the Gabba. Oh. He's in the Shield team of Victoria. So, happy birthday to Pete. Milestone birthday. On Get his a birthday. Get a hat trick. Patrick on his birthday. Work, um, warm up those vocal cords, Tabby. <laughs> Not yet he hasn't. Not yet he hasn't. Not yet he hasn't. It's tomorrow. Um, That's so, when he so, will take a hat so trick. So Peter Siddle's birthday is tomorrow. Uh, I am the flyover with the planes. Were you in the press box when that happened? Yeah, I didn't know what was happening, though. I just felt everything wobbling. <laughs> yeah, like three jets flew right over the top of the stadium, like within metres of the roof. Must I'm sure this was planned. West Coast Eagles pre-season training because <laughs> those jets were tearing up the training track. <laughs> Harley Reid was flying one of them. An absolute uh, weapon. Please tell us next time you're going to do that. Um, don't do that stuff. Yeah, Simon Cuddy really fell this. out of the fucking window of our yeah, commentary box. I know. Don't like. It's just send a text <laughs> or something. Anyway, that's it. That's has that's been us. the final word daily. Australia, India, third day of the Test match at yeah. Perth. Jeff Lemon, Adam Collins. Yeah, only last thing to say, cbussuper.com.au. Get your super sorted out. Uh, past performance, not a reliable indicator of future performance. Thanks to our patrons. If you're new to the show, I suspect, Jeff, yep. we're going to have some people it watching this on YouTube who've never watched this before. Follow our podcast. Jump on our feed. Um, click subscribe. Click rate for the pod. We, we talk about test matches. We talk about the history of the game. We're not parochial. Um, we're global cricket lovers, fans, commentators, writers, authors, all the rest of it. Stick with us through the rest of this series and well beyond as well. Send a link out to your friends and say, <laughs> check out these two dickheads. Um, and <laughs> I don't know, find something to get mad about. People love doing that too. All right, that's it. We'll be here for day four. Let's have the daily show works at patreon.com slash the final word if you want to find us and get the ad free feed, uh, the show that doesn't have the ads. All right, that's it. See you later. Good night.